under the Trump administration been asleep. It didn't require people to have protective gear, didn't provide masks, didn't provide tests. And that's why people are afraid to go to work. It's just very simple. If, you, if your choice is work or dying, people would rather not die. Uh, it was absolutely essential that we provide assistance. Now, the way that money has been administered by the Trump administration and the legislation that was adopted was not the best designed. You contrast the uh, uh, programs that were enacted in several of the European countries, in New Zealand, uh, where they said, let's keep the connection between employees and their firms. Let's keep that going so that when we do recover, that connection will be there and we can start up the economy. That was the idea, and most of these other countries succeeded. UK had something like that and succeeded. The United States is number one in unemployment, number one in disease, number one in deaths. And that's all because of failed policies. And the policy we're talking about here is the failure to design a program that would provide income to ordinary individuals and keep them at the same time connected with their employer particularly important in this pandemic because most Americans require, uh, rely on health insurance provided by the employer, not like other uh, civilized countries. We don't recognize uh, in the United States the right of access to, uh, to health care. And in the last three years, life expectancy is already down. And without health insurance, it's going to get even worse. OK, well, plenty more to continue with. I want to go back to our exclusive after the pandemic poll, something that tells us about the economic priorities of the public. We asked people to spend a moment thinking about the money the government has borrowed during the course of the outbreak. Now, here's what we found. 49% said they thought ministers should maintain spending even if that meant the amount of borrowing and the national debt grew larger. That's against 20% who said they believed the government should reduce borrowing and attempt to balance the budget. So 49%, uh, nearly half, saying maintain this spending, 20% uh, saying reduce the borrowing. So more than two to one in favour of continuing the spending. Stephen Moore. Well, I just had a piece in the Wall Street Journal yesterday uh, showing that if we continue to spend it the way we're doing in the United States for the first time in American history, uh, government spending at all levels will be higher than our private sector. That is a very scary thing for the land of the free, a country that is supposed to believe in free markets. And, and you know, if you have the government now larger than the entire production of private enterprise and, and a private worker output, that... That means that uh, this is this is more than Bernie Sanders could have ever imagined. So we have to stop the spending. What I have proposed, and Art Laffer and other uh, economists, is to suspend the payroll tax that's imposed on every worker in America and every small business in America as a way to get people back to work. And by the way, the professor's just wrong on this. Professor, people under the age of 35 are not vulnerable to the to the coronavirus. That's the one lesson we've learned: that two thirds of the the deaths have been people in nursing homes in the last year of their life. So there's been a scare campaign by the media that has not informed people what's really happening. We didn't know that eight weeks ago. We do know that now, that we have to keep our seniors safe. The, the governors like uh, Andrew Cuomo um, did not keep their nursing homes safe and they're responsible for thousands of lives. But young people can return to the job. They do want to return the job, and that should be their choice. They should make the, if, they're, if they don't feel safe to go back to the job, they shouldn't have to. But I guarantee you there are tens of millions of Americans who want to get back on the job, and they can do so safely. Well, Stephanie Kelton, take that on board as well, uh, along with the uh, continue the spending. There's a lot of uh, science coming up from uh, that position as well, a lot of medicine as well. Uh, let the young people out and they can kickstart the economy. All right. So we continue to say that until people feel safe, they are not going to re-engage with the economy. I think that is the correct thing to say. This virus does not discriminate. Yes, some 
age demographics get more heavily hit, but frontline workers, overwhelmingly younger people, also contracted this virus. And we're still learning a lot about this virus. We're learning that it infects the blood system, the, the blood vessels. And so we don't yet know exactly who the vulnerable population is, but one life is too many to take risks and chances and say, oh, well, these people were almost at the uh, on death's door anyway, so what, what difference does it make? Let's carry on with the economic activity and let the old folks just uh, fall away. That's awful. Okay, look, um, on, on this point about the payroll tax and this idea that the way that we're going to restart the economy is by cutting payroll taxes, it is almost as if the Republican Party and Stephen, who helps to advise this party, manages in every possible situation to find a way to get money to the people who least need the help. You're talking about a payroll tax holiday, which means that you want to cut taxes for people who are on payroll, who are employed. What we're worried about are the 40 million people who have already lost their jobs. They've lost their income. And to the extent that they go back into the workplace, it's because we've allowed their unemployment insurance to expire. We didn't extend it. They don't have alternatives. They've got to meet rent. They've got to buy food. They have to pay bills. And they're going to be forced back into an economy that is a dangerous environment with a pandemic that is still raging. Why? Because we are not anywhere close to doing the testing we ought to be doing at this stage. Okay. We need to be testing okay. about 23 million people a day. We are nowhere near that. So we're telling people to go back out where it's dangerous and work and produce, and they will have no alternative. OK, we've got a question uh, on that topic, on taxes coming up. We have a question from Nadeem Ahmed from West London about the impact of the government's actions and uh, the furlough scheme in particular might have. Uh, Nadeem, please share your question with us. Hi, good evening, Dermot. Good evening, panel. Good afternoon, panel. Um, basically, given that we will be in a recession after the pandemic's finished, what taxes might the government consider to cover for the costs of the furlough schemes. OK, taxes, will they have to go up? Can I just ask you while you're with us, Nadim, have you been furloughed uh, or have you lost your job or anything mm. like that? Yeah, I, I've lost my job due to the pandemic. It did impact the business. So I'm one of those unfortunate ones. And yes, so that's the reason why my question, I didn't get furloughed. That is a question that's been addressed elsewhere. But um, that was my main concern, to see what we do with that. OK, the costs involved in all this. Will taxes have to rise? Well, thank you very much indeed for that, Nadeem. I should say one of our panellists, uh, Stephen Moore, uh, has had to go in his advisory role. We are told he has to uh, take a call from the White House. He will be back to rejoin us and perhaps he might share with us uh, what discussions he has had, uh, given what's going on in the United States uh, at the moment. But uh, let's uh, ask about taxes and costs, and we've been talking about tax cuts to stimulate the economy. Uh, Lord Brown, which way do you think it should go in the UK as it tries to recover with this huge amount of spending, huge amount of debt being accru accrued, a, a huge deficit building 300 billion plus perhaps in this year? Should taxes rise as a result? Uh, I expect taxes will rise as a result. Uh, it's a, a practical matter. I, I do think several other things will happen. First is, uh, I, it, it's very clear that the government will end up uh, owning pieces of companies, and they have to decide what to do, not to drive them as bureaucracies, but to drive them in an enlightened way so that they can expand and flourish uh, when they come out of uh, care, as they are at the moment. Secondly, I do think taxes will rise, and that would be expected. And thirdly, debt levels, I think, will stay high for some time uh, until we can get back on a, a growth track. So we have to be very careful. I think we will probably have an attitude of make-do in many areas. We will probably expand investment uh, in other areas which will increase jobs, which at the cost of investment as opposed to revenue expenditure from the government as well as business. But uh, I, would Nadeem, uh, I, I see you nodding along to that. Do you think um, taxes should ride, rise or just will have to rise? Well, I think from a business, percent, business perspective, it would make sense. But I think looking at all those people who have been furloughed, they probably should have to shoulder some of those. I mean, you've got to remember, not everybody's been furloughed, so it would be very unfair for those to have to... Um, 
pay for taxes to an extent to cover the cost, especially if they have never taken anything from the government. I mean, I think maybe it needs to be looked at in a fair way, perhaps. Joseph Stiglitz, uh, on the overall borrowing and, and spending and the, and the tax approach, um, eight trillion I saw today is the congressional estimate on what the United States is going to have to borrow, print or find over the next 10 years to pay for all this, eight trillion dollars. Well, first, let me say that the debt itself is not going to be a, much of a problem because we're likely to see a uh, very weak economy. Interest rates are going to be very low. Uh, all the for forecasts are for very low interest rates as far as the eye can see. The market says this. So if interest rates are close to zero, the cost of the debt, uh, servicing the debt, is close to zero. So. Uh, I'm not worried about the debt for the immediate future. And uh, to echo what was said before, the worries about the debt should not inhibit us from doing what we need to do to protect the vulnerable and to resuscitate the economy. Now, at the same time, uh, there is room for increased taxation, uh, more room in the United States than in the UK. But for instance, uh, I'm sure uh, Lord Brown will agree on this, we have to redirect our economy to the economy of the future. And one area of that economy of the future is a greener economy. So environmental taxes would have a double benefit. They would raise revenue and they would steer the economy towards uh, a better economy, to a greener economy. Uh, and you can do this in a way that are uh, distributionally uh, beneficial. Uh, a second example in the United States, uh, the corporations are not paying their fair share of taxes. So they were, and, and we know that we have many corporations with a lot of monopoly power, uh, and they're making their returns not from uh, innovation, uh, but it's from the exploitation of monopoly power. And if we could tax some of that monopoly power, huge sources of revenues that we could use. And in the United States, uh, the people at the top, the very richest, are actually paying a lower tax than people down below. So we have a regressive tax system. If we just had a fair tax system, we would have a lot more tax revenue. The same thing is true to a lesser extent in the UK. Stephanie Kelton, I'm sure you agree with an awful lot of that. But as I say, $8 trillion or more just for the United States, sure, the United States can either borrow or print it, but ultimately, won't that be inflationary? You just hit on the, the critical point. I mean, that is the relevant limit. So if we are looking at an economy that is depressed and that is likely to remain depressed for years to come, in fact, just yesterday here in the United States, the Congressional Budget Office um, released a report saying that they anticipate now that the United States economy is going to sacrifice the equivalent of about $16 trillion in lost output over the course of the next 10 years. Why? Because they expect that the, re that the economic recovery is going to be very sluggish, that they, we're not going to operate our economy at full employment. In other words, we're going to have depressed conditions for a very long period of time. What that means is that there is room in the economy for the federal government to provide continued support in the form of fiscal policy. That fiscal support can eat up some of that slack in the economy and help move us to a more robust recovery and a quicker return to full employment. So I'm not preoccupied with the size of the deficit or the impacts on the debt. What I care about is what you just mentioned, the inflation risk. If we try to drive things too fast, too far, the punishment is not going to be insolvency for the federal government. It's not going to be that we wreck our finances. It's going to be that we cause inflation to accelerate. I don't think we're anywhere near um, facing that kind of a risk. I think the much greater risk is that we do too little, not too much, and we end up with double-digit unemployment for a prolonged period of time and an economy that continues to fall well short of full employment.
OK, so inflation, not a risk uh, in your estimation at the moment. Listen, time for another question from our virtual audience. And I know it's a specific one. Uh, Phil Docking, who joins us from Crete. Very good evening to you, Phil. And uh, what would you like to good ask? Evening. Uh, well, given the predictions that the job market will contract drastically after the pandemic, isn't it time to ditch the capitalism light model of full employment and start working on more progressive economic policies such as universal basic income? Aha, universal basic income. I wondered when that might come up uh, from Phil there. Joseph Stiglitz uh, nodding along there. Well, for the uninitiated, like most of us, what is it? How does it work? I know it's been tried out in some countries, in some areas. Just explain the bones of this policy. Well, universal basic income says you'll give uh, money to everybody, universal, uh, a basic level uh, that allows them to survive. Uh, and it says not means tested. You don't have application forms. You don't have to go through a bureaucracy. Everybody uh, gets it. Well, I'm not a basic. Uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, universal basic income, uh, and the reason for that is very simple. Right now, and for the next 15, 20, 25 years, we have an enormous amount of things that need to be done. Uh, we have to finance the green transition. We have huge deficiencies in in our infrastructure. There are people who need health care. Uh, we have a large number of jobs that need to be done, and we have people who want to work. That mismatch is the failing of our market economy today. And what we need to do is to say everybody who wants a job and is able to get to work ought to have a job. That was the commitment in the United States what we made in the Full Employment Act of 1948. And that should be our primary com commitment today. And it's exactly what Stephanie is saying. There are lots of people who want to work. There's dignity associated with work. And our failure is not to have our economic system provide that work, given all the things that need to be done today. OK, so jobs, uh, not uh, free money, not a universal basic income. In your estimation there, Professor, let's see... Uh, if our audience agree with you. Another straw poll, if you would uh, very much appreciate this. Let me ask you about the universal basic income. How many of you would like to see a change in the way the economy works? Put your hands up if you would support a universal basic income. Now you know how it works after listening to Professor Stiglitz. And let me add the rider in there, even if it meant a significant increase in taxes. So here's the question. Hands up if you would support a universal basic income, even if it meant a significant increase in taxes. <laughs> well, 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 80% uh, disagreeing perhaps with Joseph Stiglitz and uh, Lord Brown let me ask you isn't it then a disincentive to work if you've got just enough to live on being given to you by the state why would you work well part of it is I think explained in dignity I think people do actually want to work uh, in the large bulk uh, but it's right that uh, there should be not disincentives it's it's crazy if people uh, earn more money by not working rather than actually working. So we need to think very carefully. And we've been, I, I think the nations have moved from, you know, basic uh, minimum wage to living wage. And, and there are progressive changes here, uh, which I think we shouldn't stand in the way of. I mean, there'd be more changes. But you're absolutely right. We've got tons of things to do. We need people in work. We need them trained in the right way. But uh, to get the economy to be really green, uh, to get net zero emissions, we need brand new jobs. I think in healthcare, we've seen a, a, probably a lack of people who do one thing that only humans can do, which is to give people empathy. Probably we need more workers in this particular area. Uh, and then as to infrastructure, there's so much of it that needs replacing for a modern economy uh, that there's a huge amount to do there. So I, I think okay. that there's a, a lot uh, which has to be done. We need to encourage and inspire people to want to have